Hi everybody, thank you for attending this talk. Uh, my name is Florent Morin. As you can tell by my wonderful accent, I'm from France. And I'm going to try to explain to you uh, how in our game, Burby My Love, we try to make the player feel helplessness. Now, helplessness is not a feeling that is often explored in video games, but when you tackle certain topics, you just don't have the choice, and that was our case. I'm supposed to, to remind you to turn off your phones, and also if we don't have time for any, any questions at the end of the talk, we can meet uh, in the wrap-up room of Outlook 2022. Thank you. So, very quickly, who am I? I'm a former journalist. Uh, I've been a journalist for 10 years before I started making video game, and then I founded the Pixel Hunt in 2013. And the Pixel Hunt is a video game studio that specializes in reality-inspired game. What are reality-inspired games? Well, I'll come back to it in a moment. Um, our latest game is Bury My Love. No, I'm sure a lot of people here have already played it, but I'm not sure everyone has, so here's a quick trailer for you to get familiar with the project. Bury My Love is a reality-inspired game. It is a game that is directly based on true, real-life events. In our case, the story of migrants who fled from Syria and are still fleeing from Syria today and try to reach Europe in hopes of a better life. It was written by the help of Dana. Dana is a Syrian woman who left Damascus in 2015 and who is now living in Germany. And we met Dana because of uh, an article in uh, French newspaper Le Monde, where she was uh, telling the story of how she kept in touch with her family via WhatsApp uh, for all the journey she made. So this, this was a very inspiring story, and we decided to make a game that would uh, mimic the way migrants use messaging apps. Because you may or may not know that nowadays, almost every migrant has a smartphone. And for them, that's not a luxury. That's actually the only way they have to keep in touch with their friends and families. So that's very crucial to them. Then again, when you make a reality-inspired game, there are ethics you have to respect. And they are actually quite close to journalism or documentary filmmaking ethics. So I was already familiar with them before I started making games. Uh, things you could, you should do, is to respect reality. You have to gather a lot of documentation. You have to be really sure to really know what you're talking about. And you also obviously have to listen to the people who actually experience the story you are telling in your games. There also are, are things that you should not do. And the main and most important thing, and the, the thing that is really different from classic games, is that you should not be too player-centric. Uh, a lot of games focus on the player and on fun, and sometimes that makes players a little bit like untitled brats. They, want, they, they expect that the game is built around 
and for them and for the pleasure. That's not what we did for Burmy My Love. That, uh, that made us get some, some hefty comments, but still we are happy with it because it was uh, mandatory uh, for the topic we wanted to tackle. So, I pushed the wrong button because I'm so scared. <laughs> <laughs> what we learned, actually listening to migrants, uh, we've been listening to Dana, obviously we've, we've been chatting with Dana on, over WhatsApp, uh, asked her lots of questions, but we also listened to lots of other migrants and read and saw things. Uh, and what we learned is that uh, no matter how you prepare your journey, things will go sideways. There are too many things that you cannot control, that you are not aware of, too many policies that change, don't, so you... So you will need to adapt. You will uh, more often than not have the feeling that uh, you are not in control at all. Also, being connected with your loved ones is nice because you have them in your pocket. You can give them updates on your situation. But it's also very hard because they are always with you uh, while not being physically with you. So if something bad happens to you, what should you do? Should you tell them? Should you keep them from knowing because you don't want them to worry? Should you lie to them? This is, this is difficult. And it's also difficult uh, on the other side, when you're someone who's stayed in Syria or who's already in Germany, and you're waiting for news and you don't get news, whereas you should, you, you, you know you could get news because they have a phone. What happens? What, what, what's going on? This is very difficult to live through. And for those who stay or for those who are already uh, arrived, Helplessness is the feeling that they get the most, and this is the feeling that they have the most trouble dealing with. So that's why we designed our entire game around this feeling of helplessness. We wanted you as players to obviously not live their lives because it's just a video game, but to empathize and to understand what, they, what those people go through. So how did we do that? How did we convey this feeling of helplessness uh, as a game design? Uh, first of all, <clears throat> we put you in a position where you are not on the ground. It's not you who travels. Uh, you play as Majd, Noor's husband, and I don't even like to say that because you're not really playing as Majd. Majd, Majd is a character on his own, and sometimes he will say things that you would probably not say because maybe of cultural differences or anything. So it's not even a, about you as the player, but the character you are impersonating is not on the ground. He's not the one who is living things. So uh, that, that's a kind of a special situation for a video game. So to make you understand that, we thought we had to make a very living Noor. We wanted to convey to you the feeling that you were talking to a real person, that Noor was really alive. And uh, how did we make that? First, we tried to make her as consistent as possible. Noor is brave, she's zestful, she's independent, she's also fairly stubborn, and she has a tendency to trust people too easily. Those were our writing guidelines that we tried to keep along the way when we were writing the 110,000 words of the game. Because we wanted you, no matter which path you would take, to feel that you were really connecting and bonding with a real person. Then again, Noor lives uh, through very tough times, and sometimes she will lie to Majd. This comes from a testimony from Dana, and I think it's one of the best proofs of love that you can even give someone. You are living through a very terrible situation, and you don't want to tell your loved ones because you don't want them to worry. So Noor lies to Majd, and she lies to you, and sometimes if you're very careful, if you, if you read her, all her message very carefully, you will notice over time that she told you some, something at one moment, and then you realize that it wasn't the complete truth. So that makes you feel helpless. Why did she feel compelled to hide things from you? Because they are terrible things, because she thought you could not do anything about that? That's up to you to imagine. And also, Noor hesitates when she talks to you. And this is also an important way to make you feel that she actually leaves things. Uh, one very quick technical point. Uh, to make Burmy My Love, we used uh, Inkle Studios uh, scripting language, Ink. 
and because it's open source and because it's awesome and because the people are at Inkle Studios are super dope, so thank them. Okay, and in the script we put some commands and for instance these fake commands followed by a time in milliseconds will make uh, this little animation of no race typing appear on the screen then disappear. So you would think as a player, oh she wanted to tell me something but she changed her mind. Why did she do that? And you don't have the answer. You just have to imagine why. Also, Majd is not on the ground, so, but he loves Noor, so he wants to help her very, very, very bad. So he will feel compelled to give advice, even though you don't have enough information to know which advice is good or which advice is bad. So sometimes you will give Noor bad advice and you will maybe feel bad about that, but it came from a, from a good part of your heart. You wanted to help her. You just didn't know what the consequences would be. But the main feature uh, to make you understand that you are not on the ground is the fact that Brave My Love is a game that consists of 99% of waiting. You are actually not playing the game. You can put the phone in your pocket because Noor has to do things and she doesn't have time to chat with you and so you have to wait for a new notification for, it, for her to come back to you. Uh, she's the one who's leaving the things. You, you are just the one who is there for her if she needs you, but she doesn't always need you. How did we convey that? First, we had uh, three states for Noor. The basic state is that she's online, so, so she appears online like in every chat applications. Uh, but when we, when we add a little command line on the script, uh, wait for 30 minutes and be busy, then uh, the, um, the status turns to busy. So you know that she, she's still connected, she's still there, she's normally okay but she can't talk to you because she has things to do. But sometimes there will be waiting times where Noor will appear as offline. And then you will start wondering what happened, why? Why is she completely offline? Doesn't she have battery in the phone anymore? Is she in a zone where there's no uh, signal, no coverage? Or is something worse happened? Well, you will not know until Noor is back online. And as you are not on the ground, you will not decide when she will be back online. Also, we did not hesitate to populate the game with very, very short sessions. For instance, in this screenshot, you must wait for 20 minutes uh, for her to come back, and she just comes and tells you that she's approaching the border and that she will be away from coverage, and so she, will, she, she can't talk to you anymore. And then she's off again. So you have a notification, you read three sentences, and then you can put your phone back. We tried to do that in order to make you feel that she's the one leaving the things and you are not. <clears throat> the second point is that even when you can talk to her and even when you make choices, you are uh, often not, not really in control. To explain that, I have to give you a little detail about how Noor work, works as a game character. She's defined by three variables. The first one is her money. She leaves a country with a a sum and she will have to pay smugglers to pay for a bed, uh, to eat food and everything. And sometimes she will reach situations when if she doesn't have enough money, she can't do some things. But there are two other uh, variables that are more psychological. The first one is the, the love, the love relationship between her and you. And sometimes you will give her advice that will maybe make her love you less or love you more and you, you will not know that. And the third one is her morale. Is she doing okay? Did she live through something that uh, was really bad for her morale? The, those three variables are evolving uh, during the entire games, game. And this is important because sometimes, very rarely, in fact, you will have direct decisions. When Noor doesn't know what to do, for instance, should, should, she, should she go to location A or location B, she will ask you and you will be able to tell her what to do. And if she's in a good mood, she will listen to you. And sometimes she will not listen to you because she's stubborn. But you will then have direct decision. Okay, go that, go that way, I think it's better. And she will follow your advice. But, but that's very rare actually in the game. Most of the very important decisions that you will have to make are blind. I mean, when you make them, you don't know that they are actually important decisions. You, you just know that they are decisions that might seem trivial 
or that might seem not very important, but that might have very important consequences later on. We, we keep you in the dark on that for, for the very same reason. We want you to not feel in control. And also, uh, there will be decisions that you will not even be aware you are making because you will not make a, a conscious choice. For instance, very often in the game, you will answer no with an emoji. And you see in this example that you can answer with three different emojis. And two of them will give her a plus, plus two in her love for you. And one will, will give her a minus six points in love for you. That's actually very small values. It's not a lot. But it's cumulative. And decision after decision after decision, your relationship with her will, will evolve. And her morale will evolve. And then she will reach a point in her journey when she will need a special, a certain level of morale or a certain level of love for you to take a decision or another decision. And she will reach that point and take the decision accordingly. So you will not have a direct control on the choice, but the choice will happen anyway because it's cumulative over time. But in any case, those variables are never displayed. They are never visible to the player. We don't want you to check for every choice you make, like you, you, like, like you would do in Reigns, for instance, when you have a direct feedback over the variables of the game. We want you to follow your guts and to give her the best advice you think, the advice you think are best. And we, we came up with this idea after a long thinking process. Uh, in the beginning, we thought we would add to the status bar a mood indicator that would vary. Uh, depending on the level of love and level of morale that Noor would feel, and uh, that would give you um, a little clue about how she felt. But we felt that it would be too extra diegetic, that it would feel too much like a game and not enough like talking to a real person. So we decided to put, put this away. What we did is at some moment in, in the game script, we changed some expressions of Noor depending on her condition. So the only way you have to know how she feels is to really, really pay attention to how she talks to you. The third thing we wanted to put in the game to make you feel this helplessness is that we wanted to be clear that for migrants, life is not fair and also that death is part of the journey. We actually had a very long discussion among the team about this question. After all, we spend a lot of time building the relationship between you as a player and Noor. So making her die can be terrible. And also, we are talking about the real lives of real people who really are risking their lives. So would it be disrespectful to put death in the game? But actually, we, we thought that it was the contrary, the other way around. It would have been disrespectful not to, to put death in the game because they are risking their lives and you should not ignore that. So there are 19 different endings in the game and some of them are very bad, including death situation. And there are 39 ways to reach one of those 19 endings. And as you can see, some of them are, some of them are really bad. But the majority of them are somewhere in between and that comes directly from the documentation phase where we noted that for most migrants, when they stop uh, migrating, that's because they are stuck somewhere. They have to wait for, in a camp for their administ administrative status to evolve, and they don't know. They are stuck in limbo, and we wanted to render that in the game also. But let me give you an example of how death can occur in the game, and you will see how unfair this is. This is the smuggler sequence. I'm sorry, but it's a slight spoiler to the game, but then again, it's a conference, so I have to unveil things. And in the smuggler seconds, you are in Izmir. It's a Turkish city, uh, not far away from Mediterranean Sea. And Noor wants to take a boat to cross to Lesbos in Greece. So the first choice you have to make is decide together which smuggler she is going to, to see, to, to cross the sea. Uh, she can decide between a smuggler she doesn't know but has met on the ground or uh, another smuggler that, was, uh, ve that she vaguely knows through um, mutual acquaintance. Uh, so you have to choose that and you don't know which one is the best. You just have to trust your guts once again. 
Then she asks you, did I forget something? Do you think about something I should take on my journey, on my boat journey? And you can advise her to take seasickness medicine or a flashlight. Why should you decide to tell her one thing or another? I don't know. You should decide because you think one, one thing is best, but you have no, no, no reason, no particular reason to decide. And depending on those two choices, you can reach three, four different endings to this sequence. In one of the combinations, Noor ends up okay. She crosses the sea, and it's tough, but uh, it's, she, she arrives fine. In two of them, she makes it, but the, the journey is very, very complicated, and she, she's in a trauma because she sees things that are, that are tough. And in the last one, you get to an ending. And in Burmima Love, every ending is an audiologue, and this is the audiologue you get. Let me tell you something. If I was a player and I played the game like that, that uh, after two choices that I didn't have any idea of how to take them or to make them uh, ended up like that, I would want to punch the game designer in the face. <laughs> Please don't punch, punch me in the face. As a game designer, I think it's, it's important to make you feel helpless and frustrated and feel that it's terribly unfair because it is but simply because what we are talking about here is a terribly unfair situation, so sorry. Actually, the only thing migrants have is to live by the moment. They know better than everyone that it's not the destination that matters. It will matter at, at a time, but they take one day after another, and it's the journey that matters. And that's what we tried to do also in Bury My Love. We wanted you to feel that way, to care about the journey, to care about the good moments that you may encounter, to care about the bad moments that you may also encounter, and to understand that there will be many unexpected ones, many surprises, many moments where you will have to adapt to compensate for your lack of control. So, to render that, we made another thing that any good game design teacher would advise strongly against, is that there is no safe points in Burmima Love. Uh, even when you reach an ending, you cannot start back from one part of the story and decide, oh, I made this decision, but it was very wrong. I want to go back there and change my decision. You cannot do that in Burmima Love. You have only two solutions when you reach an ending. The first one is to restart from day one. And why is that? That is because for us, Noor is not a real person. Contrary to what I told you, for us, Noor is a metaphor for the thousands and hundreds of thousands of persons who actually did this journey. And we wanted you to feel that way, that every time you play Burning My Love, you play someone else. You play a new, a new person that is trying to face a new situation. But you have another possibility. You can also never play the game again. And, and that's not a troll. I'm, I'm, I, I really mean it. I really, I'm completely OK with that. You can never play the game again. Because ultimately, Bury My Love is a game about coming to terms with the idea that no matter how much you love someone, there are times when you simply cannot save them. Thank you. <clears throat> I hope you have questions because I've been rushing through the presentation to have, be lucky enough to discuss it with you.
Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Jeremy. It's great to meet you. Thank you so much for, for doing this and presenting. It's, uh, I don't even know how to, do, I have words. Um, I have a lot of questions. I'll ask one for now. Um, why is it important for you for players to feel helpless when playing this game? And how does, how does getting your players to feel that make them care about the situation? Um, I'm, I'm not a, how to put that? I'm, uh, this is not advocacy. I, I don't care about changing the player's mind or anything. I'm, I'm not an NGO. I don't have an agenda. An, an agenda. I'm, nor do I have. Nor do I want to make a political statement. Uh, when I documented for this game, I was so overwhelmed by how unfair and and terrible those situations were. And I thought to myself, if we, in in the situation we are in, privileged situation we are in, can have a game that can make us give us a glimpse of what it is to go through those situations, it is worth it. We should, do, we should try to do a game like that. So that's the main reason why I wanted to make this game. And that's why I decided to design the whole game around this idea that the player should feel the same way. Thanks. Welcome. Uh, hi. Hi. So first of all, uh, congrats on like having the guts to make all those like tough decisions, uh, like going against um, the usual conventions of of the game design. But my question is about so that audio log thing was very powerful, um, very emotional. Uh, when you when you built that, uh, how did the community or you know react to it, and uh, did their reaction affect how you guys ended up? Uh, like handling that kind of thing, that, that emotional stuff? Um, actually, uh, it didn't have any impact because we, di we weren't in an open development, so we didn't have any feedback on the game. Oh, Why? Well, yes, we ran playtests, but they were mostly functional playtests, and we had some questions in the playtest on the writing styles and the endings, but we didn't really care about those. <laughs> we really wanted to be sure that people knew how to, where to click, but the story was ours. And I think that it's important. You know, I've, I've, I've lots of dis discussion with uh, the, the people in the games industry in France about are there authors uh, in video games? And they say, no, it's a common work. There's no authors. We're not filmmakers or anything. And I get that. But I also think that some games should, should be the work of authors, and they should decide what they want to make, and regardless of what the audience may or may not think. And if we make bad choices, then the game will be bad and it will be on us. But, you know, that's like every piece of art. It's our responsibility. Okay, thank you. Uh, hey, I actually have really two really quick questions. Um, first, I wanted to say a really good presentation. It was cool seeing how you treated Nor as a person and you're able to have her like maybe decide not to text you, which is really cool. But um, my first question is, as a journalist, do you see yourself having more stories, maybe in a similar context, maybe not, in the future with more games coming up with Pixel Hunt? And my second question is, where'd you get that shirt? That's pretty rad. <laughs> Threadless. Okay, that's a good shirt. Okay, for the first question, uh, I definitely intend to make only reality-inspired games, but that doesn't mean that it's only only inspired by the news mm -hmm. or the or the the real events. Actually, my my next project is about something much more intimate, mm -hmm. what it means to be uh, a person, and what is important for us. Uh, so it won't be directly linked to something that happens in the world, but I think we are all part of the world, so we are all something that happens in the world. Cool. That sounds great. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, he asked what I wanted to ask already, so <laughs> I just wanted to congratulate you on almost making an entire room of grown-up people cry with that audio. <laughs> I it's, do by, you... it's by Chloe Hollings, and she's a very, very ta talented voice actor. And the French voice actor, Baya Reaz, is like, she, I cried in, while recording the audio with her. It was amazing. Oh, amazing. So it was very sad, actually, but you know what I mean. Um, I do agree. That's a really red shirt. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, 
I almost came with another one, so I'm pretty glad. <laughs> Any oh, thank you, thank you very much. It was a wonderful presentation. Um, I have a question for you. Uh, is the game actually waiting for you to make a decision, or it's like an ongoing process? So basically, whether you interact with a with a character or whether you not, it's like a, it's like continuous journey. Do you have to play the game for it to for it to complete? Yes, definitely, and, and that's actually. Something that's a bit subtle, and I'm very frustrated with my English right now because I don't, I can't explain it the way I would, I would want it to be explained. But the idea that you choosing an emoji over another can mm. completely change the whole story. Such a mundane thing as an emoji can mm. have a little, little impact on Noor, but that's just the, the thing that makes her drop or that helps her to keep going, this is really important. And lots of people have told us, but this is a linear game. I, I don't have the, the impression, I'm not under the impression of making any choice. And they, they did not replay the game, so they did not notice that they could mm. have two playthroughs and never see one single scene in common. And that's actually a compliment, because I don't want them to have the feeling that they have power and control over the story. I want them to live the story and, and, and and just leave it in the moment, as those guys in, in the real life do. Yeah, I understand. Thank you very much. Thank you. So thanks, everybody. Uh, that's it. Um, I had something else I, sh I should tell, tell, tell you, but I don't remember what it is. Uh, oh, yeah, don't forget to rate this, <laughs> this talk. <laughs> Thank you very much.